Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but I did play professional football for the Minnesota Vikings for a long time. And then I wanted to win a Super Bowl, so I had to leave, because that's how it works in Minnesota. And uh, I went to the Baltimore Ravens. So let's just get it out there. Are there any Steelers fans here tonight? Okay. Okay, so I'll speak slowly. So you guys don't get confused. I won't use any big words, all right? I come, I come in peace, okay? Um, I am thrilled to be here. Uh, when I was invited to come speak at Franciscan University, I was pumped because I'd never, never been here before. And I do, Danny, I do think this is the best Catholic university in the world. And yes, I do. And so when I told my wife, I got invited to come speak at Franciscan, she said, really? Like, are you, are you Catholic enough? I said, well, yeah, I think so. And she's like, well, like, what are you going to talk about? I said, they've got enough spiritual direction at Franciscan. I said, I'm going to talk about football, because huh? that, that's what I know. Uh, and yeah, fa Father and I were talking earlier today. I think he wants me to announce that this fall, Franciscan is going to have a football team, right? <laughs> print, print that. Um, no, I, 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 I am passionate about the Catholic faith, and I'm passionate about sports. And, uh, and those two go together. Those, uh, sports can be a very powerful evangelization tool. We talk about sports a lot of times in the secular way that sports can help prepare kids for life but it can help prepare kids and help them know Jesus Christ. Okay, so I'm gonna stick with what I know, which is, which is football. Uh, and I, you know, I, I learned that a long time ago. I was actually in college. Uh, I went to a football powerhouse called Harvard University. Yes, Harvard does have a football team. We got uniforms and everything, it's great. And uh, when I got there, you know, I had to register for classes, and so there was a huge course book. I mean, they have like thousands of classes, and, I was going through there and I saw one of the classes was called the Bible. I was like, wow, there's a class called the Bible at Harvard? You know, 12 years of Catholic school, I know a little bit about the Bible. And I asked one of the upper class, and I said, should I take this class? He said, oh, tell all, your, all the freshman football players, take the Bible. I said, why? He said, it's this old guy that's been teaching it forever. Your whole grade is based on the final, so you never have to go to class. And the final, it's only one question, and it's the same question every year. I said, okay, this sounds pretty good. What's the question? He said, oh, the professor just has you write an essay, write an essay on Paul's travels. I was like, great. So the first day of the Bible, 20 freshman football players go stumbling into this big lecture hall. We get the syllabus. The, the professor gets up there, little old guy. He says, uh, now, your, your whole grade's going to be based on the final, but you got to come to class every, every week because you don't know what's going to be on the final. Okay, uh, so we left and we never went back. And then the night before the final, we all got together and we really buckled down on Paul's travels. You know, we spent, we spent a good hour on, on, on Paul and his travels and uh, went to bed early, got up, walked into that final feeling bulletproof. And uh, the professor gets up there, he says, for your final, it's just one question. I just want you to write an essay. I want you to critique Jesus's Sermon on the Mount. I mean, we're thinking, come on, like, what are the chances he changes the question the year we take? And now I start, all sorts of bad things start going through my head, like, if I fail this class, am I going to be eligible for spring football? I mean, this is, that was what was really important to me. And so I sat there for about 15 minutes and put down everything I could and just said, forget it, and I walked out. Uh, and all the rest of the guys followed suit, and we were back at the student union commiserating, you know, feeling sorry for ourselves, wondering how we're going to tell our parents we failed the Bible and thought all of our guys were there, but there was one guy missing. Uh, his name was Chris Schaefer. He was our nose tackle, so not real bright. And, uh, but we never called him Chris Schaefer. We called him the tick because he was like 5'9", 300 pounds, and he just kind of walked like this. That's how football players talk to each other. And he walks, he's got a big smile on his face. I said, tick, where you been? He goes, I just got out of the final. 
So what do you mean he just got out of the final? We, it was uh, on the Sermon on the Mount. We, we, we studied Paul's travels. What did you do? Did you fall asleep? He said, no, it was easy. I just put down, who am I to critique Jesus' Sermon on the Mount? Let me tell you about Paul's travels. <laughs> so this is not going to be some deep theological talk, but I said I'm passionate about sports for a lot of reasons, but mostly, and this is my story, is that football helped bring me back to my Catholic faith. But if you think about what you need to be successful in athletics, there's a lot of carryover. You know, as athletes, and I'll, I'll refer to myself as an athlete, I know I played offensive line, but I'm an athlete, okay? But to be an athlete, we live at a very gut level. Things are very real. You know, a lot of times we talk about metaphors, like if you get knocked down, get back up. No, that really happens in sports. In sports, you've gotta be all in. If you're not all in, you are all out. There's nothing worse on a team is to have a guy or two or three that aren't all in. And probably the biggest challenge facing our church today is lukewarm Catholics. You gotta be able to grind. You've gotta love the grind to play sports. There's a lot of lonely work that goes into it. You're gonna encounter adversity. You've gotta find a way. You gotta find a way to figure it out and get through that. You've got to overcome fear. Anybody who says they're not afraid, any athlete, everybody asks me like, oh yeah, you played in the NFL for a long time, you know, you must've kind of got used to it. Never got used to it. In fact, I, one of my pregame rituals was I threw up before every game. I did it the first game I played. I didn't play that badly. I said, well, I better throw up before every game. I would make myself throw up, but that's because that's because I was scared. It's scary. You've got to delay gratification. You have to, every day, just try to get a little bit better, a little bit better, a little bit better. You don't get, you don't get a trophy every day for practicing. You don't get a trophy for lifting weights. You find out in sports that you can do more than you think you can do. As individuals, we tend to put governor caps on ourselves. We tend to think, well, I'm not that good, or I could never do that. In sports, you find out you can actually push yourself beyond your limits. And probably the biggest thing is you're part of something bigger than yourself, that it's not about you. All those things are true in sports and they're true in our faith. And that's why I think that Franciscan and what you're doing with your sports programs, yeah, you wanna win, you run to win the race. But what you're also doing is you're using an extension of your evangelization strategy. And you're keeping college kids in the faith, which is when we lose a lot of kids. So tell me if you've heard this before, if this is an original story. So I grew up Catholic, two devout parents. Actually, my father spent a brief time in the seminary. So thankfully for me, he dropped out. Um, but we always went to mass. Went to Mass every single Sunday, never missed Mass. We would be up north, northern Minnesota, camping somewhere, and Sunday morning we'd get up and we would drive into town, some town we'd never been to, and we would always pull up in front of the Catholic Church 10 minutes before Mass started. It was like my dad had masstimes.org before it was a thing. We never, ever, ever missed Mass. So I was given the gift of the faith as a child, but like when you we get a lot of gifts, you don't really fully appreciate them. And so uh, I wasn't any good at sports growing up, which is obvious, because that's why I became a lineman. Um, nobody chooses to be an offensive lineman, just so you know. Like there's no 10 year old boys kneeling down tonight saying, dear God, please make me an offensive lineman, okay? That's a prayer that God has never heard, all right, guaranteed. Um, but when I was in the 10th grade, I went out for football and yeah, that's when I sort of discovered two of the gifts that God gave me, which was getting in people's way and grabbing onto them, uh, which is, those are two good skills to have if you're an offensive lineman. I did say grabbing onto them, not holding onto them. Sounds kind of nuanced, but there's a big difference between grabbing and holding. It's about 10 yards of difference between the two. And, uh, and for once, I, I started to be recognized for something. You know, people say, hey, there's, there's Matt. He's, he's, he's a good football player. And I liked that. I liked being known for something. I liked other people 
admiring me, even if I was a lineman. And I got recruited, I went to college, I went to Harvard University. It's, it's an accredited university, right? And so everybody was telling me, you know, how great I was doing. You know, gosh, you're playing football, you're going to Harvard, you're doing great things, Matt. And I like that. And uh, my parents, we didn't have any money, so my parents, when they dropped me off, when I had to go to, to college, they just dropped me off at the airport. Um, I had two duffel bags, pulled up to the curb. They didn't even walk me to the gate, which you could do back then. They just dropped me at the curb and said, hey, you know, we'll, we'll come visit you when we can. And, and that was it. Uh, could at least walk me to the gate. Um, and so I got there and a coach picked me up and started practicing football. And this was before classes started. And Sunday was our off day. I woke up Sunday morning. I was in a dorm room with seven other guys. And I was waiting for somebody to say, hey, let's go to mass. And nobody said, hey, let's go to mass. And so I didn't go to mass. First time, first time in my life I missed mass. And you know, that was, that, the guilt is real. Catholic guilt is real. Uh, practiced all week. Next Sunday, skipped Mass again. It was a little easier the second time. And, you know, I'd rationalized myself that I don't have to go to Mass. You know, I've been doing that my whole life. I know all that. I'm a good person. And God, but, you know, I'm doing all these important things here. Everyone's telling me how great I'm doing. And this became my routine. It became normal to me. And about October, my mom, just my mom, came to visit and she was all proud. My mom grew up on a dairy farm. I doubt she'd ever heard of Harvard before I got there. And I was showing her all around campus. And I, was, uh, I, ended, the, I ended the tour in the middle of Harvard Yard. And I said, Mom, there's, there's Widener Library. That's the biggest library in the world, right? Kids back, we used to have these things called books. It was really great. I said, that's the biggest library in the world. That's where I go and study at night. That was the first lie I told her. And I said, Mom, there's, there's Memorial Church. That's where I go to Mass on Sundays. She said, great. I left. I went to practice. I met up with her later that night. And I said, Mom, how was the, uh, how's the rest of your day? She said, oh, it was great. I went to the library. I said, oh, yeah, it's so big. There's so many great places to study in there. And she said, yeah. And then I went into the church. And I said, oh, the beautiful liturgies there, Mom. The music's great. And she said, yeah, that's not a Catholic church. That had been good to know, Okay. I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota in the 80s. St. Paul, Minnesota it used to be a very Catholic place. I just assumed everybody was uh, Irish and Catholic. That's what I thought the world was. So I lied to my mother uh, about going to Mass. And of course, that didn't feel good, but that didn't really change my ways because, again, I was doing all these important things and all these good things in my mind. And then I get to the, I get to the NFL. I got drafted by the Minnesota Vikings, my hometown team, and now... I mean, I've got everybody patting me on the back, and now I've got a great excuse not to go to Mass, like playing the Bears today. I can't possibly go to Mass, right? And everything was going as, as good as it could have gone. I was, uh, I was starting for the Minnesota Vikings. I had signed the biggest contract in the history of the NFL for a center. Uh, I, I even have a, uh, had a hamburger named after me in St. Paul. Well, it's a pretty big deal if you're a lineman, you get a hamburger named after you. But on the inside, I was dying. I was dying and I knew it. I was not happy, I was not fulfilled. I mean, I wasn't off, I wasn't off the rails, but I knew, I knew this was not sustainable. And you know, God gives you just what you need, just when you need it, right? Like he's, he's never late, but he's, he's rarely early, right? And at that moment, he put a, a young woman in my life who I became rather smitten with um, and she became my wife. And when I met my wife, I uh, had a drug problem. She drugged me to church. And I said, you know, I'd, followed my, I'd have followed her anywhere. And uh, she said, let's go to church. I'm like, great, let's go to church. And uh, coming back, I said, okay, you know, like, sort of like St. Augustine, you know? I was like, well, I've tried everything else. You know, let me, let me try this again. And uh, started to sort of get called back. You know, it wasn't some some uh, Saul-like moment, but starting to get called back, and then uh, my wife and I had our first child, and uh, it was seven months after the wedding, do the math, um, and uh, uh, when my daughter was born, everything changed. That was, that was the moment, because I knew when I saw that happen that I had just witnessed a miracle, a mirror, like how does that, how does that happen, okay? Uh, 
And I said, that was a miracle. I've got to figure this out. And, uh, and that's when I started. I said, okay, you know, I, was, I, say, I say I'm Catholic. If people ask me, I say, yeah, I'm Catholic. But what does that mean? Am I? Uh, am I saying that out of respect to my parents? Am I saying that because I don't have a better answer? And, you know, kind of dove, dove back into the, to the Catholic faith. And that's where I really started to really learn the faith, appreciate the, the beauty and the depth of our church and, and claim the Catholic faith as my own, which we, all of us cradle Catholics have to do at, uh, at some point. So that's my story, and that's not unique. You know, I always, I joke around, I say football saved more people than Billy Graham. It's a Protestant joke. I joke around. Um, because uh, because football is a, it's a very hard game. And all those things I mentioned earlier, you know, that's hard. And as human beings, we're built in the image and likeness of God. We're, be- we're built for beauty, goodness, and truth. But, you know, especially what, there, there's a saying in football. They say, they say the game will bring you to your knees. So you might as well start there, right? Isn't that, isn't that when we tend to pray a little bit more when we're, when we're going through it, when we need God? Um, so that's, 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 my, that's my faith story. But one of the things that I really love, love about the Catholic faith is that it's, 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 it's so applicable to, to football. When, uh, when I got drafted by the Vikings, um, it was a little bit of a jump up from, from Harvard to the NFL, just, just a titch. Um, and so when I got there, I realized real quick that uh, I was not ready to play in the NFL. You know, I'd always kind of been like big, strong guy, I'd just sort of go out there, put my hand down and come off the ball and make it happen. You know, I just kind of made it happen. Well, I wasn't making anything happen early on in the NFL. And so I was sort of, I was, I was lost. I remember after the first practice, I, my first play in the NFL, I went, I went against John Randall. Now, I don't know if you remember John Randall. Okay, if you don't YouTube him, I mean, the guy is, he's not right in the head. I mean, he's, he's crazy. He'd paint his face and he'd bark like a dog and, I mean, he was nuts, but he was the best defensive lineman in the NFL. And my first play in practice in the NFL, I had to block John Randall. And I don't think I touched him, which is hard to do. It's hard to whiff on a guy that's standing right in front of you. But I did that, and I realized real quick that I was like, I can't do this. I'm not good enough to do this. And I was walking off the field, and my coach said, uh, he comes over to me, and he says, um, He says, look, he goes, have you ever played center before? Like I was drafted as a tackle. And after one practice, when your boss basically tells you, have you thought about playing another position? That's normally not a great indication that you you did well. And I said, well, no, I've never played center before. And he said, look, he said, "Um, this afternoon's practice, be out here five minutes early. We're going to practice snapping the football to the quarterbacks, okay? He's like, I think think you're going to, we're going to try to make you a center. I said, okay. So I was out there early and quarterbacks show up and for five minutes, all we did was we just practiced snapping the football. Yeah, you, know, you just bend over and put your hand on the ball. Quarterback puts his hands underneath you. Takes a little getting used to now. And we just snapped the football. Now chances are, if you've ever watched a football game or an NFL game, you've never like hit the person next to you and said, oh my gosh, did you see how the center snapped that ball? It was perfect. How does he do that? No, the only time you notice the snap is when? Yeah, when it's bad, right? When it's on the ground or over his head. And then just admit it, you always blame the center. You always blame him. You never, the quarterback's got some ownership, okay? I'm in therapy. I'm almost done. Um, <laughs> But we did that, and then the whistle blows, and then practice starts, okay? And every day after the whistle would blow, we break up into what we call individual period. So quarterbacks go over here and throw to the receivers, and D-line, they do whatever they do. And offensive linemen, we'd always get sent down in the corner, and we would get in these things called shoots, okay? And think of a shoot as like a, like a big rectangular table, with, but it's just the frame, okay? Like there's no sides, and you get in there, you get in your stance, and you got to come out, and you got to stay low. If you come up too high, you hit your head on one of the metal bars and kind of hurts and makes a loud noise. But, but it's, it's teaching you to stay low. 
because in football, leverage is everything. There's a saying in, the, in, the, in line play, it says, low man wins. Doesn't matter how much you can bench or squat, low man wins. You gotta stay low, okay? I know this is super interesting, offensive line play. It's just what you wanted to hear, okay? But we get in the shoots, and then, and then, we'd, get in the, and then we'd get out these 10 foot long, about a foot and a half wide boards, okay? And we'd call them boards. And we'd put them, <laughs> if football players were smart, trust me, we'd have done something else for a living. And we put the boards in the chute, and with the, you gotta straddle the board. And what the board trains you to do is keep your feet apart, okay? Keep a base, because when you got a base, you got, you got some strength, you got a chance. You get your feet together on a football field, that's when you get knocked over, okay? Every single day, I'd be out five minutes early, practice snapping the football, I'd get in the chutes, and then I'd come out on the boards. For 15 years, I did that every single day. Now, I think the NFL is like the highest level of football, right? I think so. I don't know. Is there a super NFL or something? I'm not aware. Uh, and that's, that's the NFL. And those are the same drills they do in college. It's the same drill the Franciscan team is going to be doing next fall. It's the same in high school. I coach middle school football because that's all I'm qualified to coach. That's all they'll let me coach. We do that too. The linemen do that too. Why? Because the fundamentals never change. What changes is the attention that we pay to them. It's human nature to say, I already know that. You know, I've already done that. What's next? It's like, no, this is it. This is it. I told you, like, playing in the NFL, it's, it's crazy. I mean, you, you, you ever walk into a stadium? I, you, like, you walk into Heinz Field, and there's 70,000 people that aren't thrilled that you're there when you're playing for the other team. There's all this stuff going on. There's millions of people watching at home. To be able to focus on those fundamentals, to be able to go back to that and make the game really, really small, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's what I did. You know, people ask me, what's it like to play in the NFL? I'm like, well, it's, you know, it's this, it's that. But I never looked at it like I was playing in the NFL. I would just go out there and try to execute the fundamentals. That's what I clung to. Good times, bad times. I was playing well. I wasn't playing well. I would just always focus on those fundamentals because I knew that the fundamentals, they win. They win. We played a... Uh, played in the Super Bowl, and uh, the first play we ran in the Super Bowl was dot right 40 gut. That doesn't sound like a super complex play, uh, because it's not. It's super, it's the most basic running play there is. I can't believe that was our first play. Like, you know, it's a Super Bowl. We're going to run dot right 40 gut. But that's what coach called, and we ran the play, and it wasn't very spectacular. I think we got like two yards, and my guy might have made the tackle. But you know, here's the point. Like, if, if you'd have had a drone over the field and take a video of that play and you were to, you were to run it back uh, and, and you remove all the, all the people in the stands and, and all, the, all the players and coaches on the sidelines and all the other players on the field and you were to just have me on there and run that video, you, just, you know what you've seen me doing? You've just seen me snapping a football. I was in the chutes, staying low, coming out on the boards. That's all I was doing. Because I knew there was 100 million people watching, and I couldn't think of that. That was, that was beyond me. That was, that, was, that was too big for me. And so, and don't, don't tell anybody this, but it doesn't really take a lot of talent to snap a football between your legs. It's, it's, not, it's not something, again, it's, it's not that hard. It doesn't take any talent to stay low. It doesn't take any talent to keep a base on a football field. It, it really doesn't. It takes commitment and it takes discipline, but it doesn't take talent. And when I think of like as a football player, what did I rely on? It wasn't, it wasn't my talent, it was my fundamentals. It doesn't take any talent to be Catholic either. Thank God, otherwise most of us wouldn't be here, right? I mean. It doesn't take any talent. And we have these fundamentals that we can practice over and over and over and over again, right? Obviously, we can go to mass. 
uh, which I had the pleasure of doing today at, at noon. It was awesome. Uh, we have the rosary. We have adoration. We have stations of the cross. We've got one million prayers. We even have the saints, right? It's like we have the hall of fame of Catholics, you know, that we can look at and say, that's what it looks like, right? I'm gonna try to be like that person or that person or that saint. It's all there. It's all there for us. We just have to, we just have to commit to doing the fundamentals. Now, I don't know if you've, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but the world's, the world's kind of a mess right now. I come from Minnesota. It's a huge mess there, okay? It's huge. The world is a mess. And can you imagine being a young person in today's world? I mean, we, we can't, I say we, I know we in this room can, but we as a, as a society, we can't even agree on basic truths anymore. Like, you know, what is a woman? Or what is marriage? These are the things that are actually being debated in the public square. Imagine being a young person in today's world, dealing with all of that, and then dealing with this world that kind of says, basically says, you're not, you're not enough, you know? You're defined by what you accomplish, with how you look, with how many Instagram followers you have, things like this. Like, no wonder our kids today are stressed and depressed and social media possessed. But you know what? Things have always been a mess. And our church has always raised up saints to combat the darkness in our world. And it'll do it again. It'll do it again. We are not, we are an Easter people. We're a people of hope. We are not a people of despair because we know, we know how it ends. How important for young people to know that their worth is not defined in what they do, how many points they score, that their worth is defined and their identity is being a beloved son or daughter of God and that that's enough, that's enough. So, last story. Did I mention I played in a Super Bowl? I did mention that? Okay. So the Super Bowl I played in was uh, where the lights went out. Do you remember that? You should, because that never happens. The lights don't go out at the Super Bowl, but the lights went out. So we were up 28 to six. Uh, we were whooping the 49ers. It was the third quarter, and it was, it was really strange because it was like, it's not supposed to go like this. It's not supposed to be this easy. Um, and then the lights went out. And then, the, and then the lights came back on. And all of a sudden, it was like a totally different game. We, we went three and out. Then we fumbled. Our defense couldn't stop them. I mean, they're just going up and down the field on us. And it kind of became one of those games where you're watching the, the clock, and you're just hoping the clock runs faster because... Sooner or later, they're going to catch up. Hopefully, they just run out of time before they do. And we were up five points. The Niners got the ball in the, uh, on their side of the field. There's about five minutes left. They drove down, and they're on our five-yard line, first and goal. And first down, they don't get it. Second down, they don't get it. Third down, they don't get it. So here we are. It was fourth down. This one play was gonna decide the outcome of the Super Bowl, and I was just sitting on the sidelines. I couldn't do anything about it. Now in the NFL, all they talk about is, it's just all about winning. You know, nobody cares who took second. There's only one winner and there's 31 losers every year. And for 15 years, I had chased this thing, you know, the Super Bowl, and here it is. It's this one play right here is gonna decide it. And I was a Vikings fan growing up. So I've seen this movie before. I've seen some epic losses, right? And I was kind of sitting there, and it's sort of amazing how your mind can work so fast sometimes. And I thought to myself, well, if they score, we've just blown the biggest lead in the history of a Super Bowl. We would have lost, 
And I knew, I knew it was my last game. Uh, I knew I was done. And uh, I was like, people are going to say that, you know, I was a failure because we didn't win. And I kind of thought, is that, is that true? And there was a time where there's, I mean, there's, there's still maybe a part of me that thought, yeah, that's, that might be true. But I had had an amazing moment of peace and serenity standing there. Not because I was necessarily confident that our defense was going to stop them, but because I knew that I had done everything the way I was supposed to do. I had committed myself to those fundamentals every single day. And I was also, I knew that there wasn't going to be one teammate that I played with that was going to be able to say that I was ever a selfish player, that I at least tried to make others around me better. And I thought, that's what I was supposed to do. I couldn't, I couldn't worry about the outcome. I was supposed to focus on what I could control and what I could do. And so fourth down came, they snapped the ball, they just threw a corner fade to the wide receiver. You know, we call it a 50-50 ball where the quarterback just throws it up and the receiver and the D-back fight for it. And um, quarterback threw it and a lot of 49ers fans and you Steelers fans too probably think that they should have called pass interference. But personally, I think it was a great no call by the officials. And the ball fell incomplete and, and we won and it was great. I mean, it's a great moment to share with my family and friends and and all that, but as I was sharing with Father Dave earlier today, um, it was a little bit anticlimactic because that's when I kind of realized like it really wasn't about, it wasn't about that. It was about that struggle and what it took to get there. There's a lot of things out of our control. It's not our job to save the world. You know, we can't anyways. But if you focus on the fundamentals and you focus on other people, the winning part just takes care of itself. Thank you very much.